Ginseng is one of those roots that is just kind of mysterious, right? We see it in these woo-woo, witch doctor, weird kind of drinks and compounds. So unfortunately, that makes kind of the alarms go off, right? Because we've been duped and fooled so many times with so many different things. Well, ginseng is one of those that is underrated, if you ask me. All right, so I'm gonna jump right into it. There is some interesting research that took a look at consuming three grams of ginseng for 12 weeks. And they did this with predominantly postmenopausal women in this particular study. They found that it elevated antioxidant levels within the body extremely high. In fact, what it elevated was something called superoxide dismutase, which breaks down superoxide. Okay, that is one of the most powerful free radicals in our body that we definitely want to help bring down. So this is very interesting to see this happening because ordinarily you can see upregulation of various antioxidants when you consume some fruits and vegetables and things like that, but not to the degree that they saw this elevate. So it's leading us to investigate this a little bit further. So there were some other bodies of research that started to look at potential mechanisms. And this is where things get a little bit speculative because that's how it is with mechanistic stuff, but still really, really fascinating. They took a look at what ginseng is kind of reacting with. And if you've followed any of Dr. David Sinclair's work in the longevity space, you might be familiar with something that's called sirtuin-1. Now, sirtuin-1 is an something that is involved with, well, a lot of things, but in the most colloquial sense, longevity, and we increase sirtuin-1 when we're fasting, and it really does help cells sort of recover and create energy, okay? It's a NAD-dependent process, so it's kind of required for NAD function and vice versa. Okay, what they saw with this was between a 22 and 40% increase in overall sirtuin activation based upon different compounds in the ginseng. What this is telling us is that we're potentially getting fasting-like effects from ginseng. This is really interesting. It doesn't mean that it's gonna totally mimic a fast, but I'm always out there trying to find what are foods that give us similar benefits upon different pathways when it comes to fasting so that we can kind of get the same benefit without always fasting. It's fascinating. So let's dive in a little bit more. Now with this, I wanna dive into the body composition piece, the weight loss piece. There's a journal that's appropriately named the Journal of Ginseng Research that looks at a lot of this stuff. Okay, and this journal published a paper, it wasn't in humans because there's not a lot of data there yet, but it was in, in mice. Okay, and they supplemented mice that were overweight, very overweight, actually obese, that were on a very high fat diet and gaining weight. They gave them either 50 milligrams per kilogram of body weight ginseng or 150 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. Okay. The 50 milligram group, after six weeks, gained 37% less weight than the control group, okay? And the 150 milligram group gained 48% less weight than the control group. I guess rather the control group gained 48% weight and the other groups did not. So in other words, the ginseng somehow was playing a role in how much weight these mice gained. So it begs the question, like what is potentially going on here? And that's exactly why this is done in rodent model studies so we can kind of investigate it more. One of the things they found is that it seemed to downregulate adipogenesis. Adipogenesis is the formation of newer fat. Why this is happening, we don't have a solid 100% answer yet. But what seems to have been happening, there seems to have been some influence in what are called transcription factors. In this particular case, uh, looking at PPAR gamma and some of these other transcription factors. So basically at a genetic level, it was seeming to help stop the formation of new fat. Now at the same time, there also seemed to be a pretty strong promotion of lipolysis, which is burning fat or liberating fat in the first place. So evidently some of these fractions that are in ginseng seem to play a role in the overall liberation of fatty acids and the cleaving of fatty acids from the triglyceride molecule and actually liberating these fats so that they can ultimately be burned. Now we have to dive deeper into understanding what could be happening with the gut microbiome with ginseng because it might actually be the main piece overall. Now this part that seems to be very fascinating as far as weight loss is concerned really does highlight the importance of the microbiome for weight loss. So there was another study, this one in humans, okay, published in the Journal of Ginseng Research. Okay, it was a small study, but still very interesting and it illuminates a lot, 10 people. Okay, and what they did is they gave them 
dosages of ginseng, okay? And they found that on average, over the course of weeks, subjects that consumed ginseng lost pretty decent amounts of weight, like over a kilogram of body weight. And what they found, this is what's really interesting, is that their levels of weight loss, how much they lost in terms of weight, varied quite a bit depending on the makeup of their microbiome. Okay, so this suggests that ginseng plays a role in the microbiome, but more importantly than that, it suggests how the changing of our microbiome can influence weight loss. So how ginseng is involved directly in that is pretty interesting mechanistically. There is something in ginseng called ginsenoseed, okay, RB1 particularly, and it gets metabolized in the gut into something called compound K or substance K. Now what this compound K is, it is an active metabolite. So it is what is called a postbiotic. So when you break down certain compounds, sometimes they get broken down into other bioactive compounds. And this compound K is only going to get absorbed if the microbiome is acting upon it properly, which highlights the importance of A, a good microbiome, but B, highlights the importance of how ginseng is involved in the microbiome. Because without this involvement in the microbiome, we wouldn't really be getting the benefits of ginseng. It's kind of interesting, but it goes further than that. There is an enzyme that's called beta-glucosidase. Now, different humans have varying levels of beta-glucosidase. This is an enzyme that is required for the formation of compound K from these glucosinocytes. So what I mean with this is that when we consume ginseng, we are actually activating a particular enzyme that is required to allow us to extrapolate more benefit or extract more benefit out of the ginseng in the first place. One of the important things to ultimately note here is that it sounds like for ginseng to do its job properly, a good healthy gut is important. So that means ginseng alongside fiber, ginseng alongside soluble fiber, things that are good for the gut might be even more pronounced or more powerful so very, very interesting. I put a link down below for a probiotic that I use if getting a lot of fiber in is a hard thing for you. It's called Seed, it's a symbiotic. It's the one that I would use, the one that I recommend when people ask me. So if you're trying to support a microbiome that might actually be potentially good for ginseng, then it's probably worth a shot. So that link is down below. That'll save you 15% off your entire order through Seed as well. So you can get a Seed subscription. It is a symbiotic, so it means it has a capsule inside of a capsule. Very, very interesting technology. So again, that link is down below. Use code THOMAS15 to save 15% off your Seed symbiotic. Now there's something that has been talked about a lot in the last like year or so, and that's the world of blood sugar and insulin. What's interesting is that now we can get into larger data, right? There was a study that was published in PLOS1 that was a meta-analysis, meaning it looked at lots of different studies to try to determine what is going on if ginseng is something that helps blood sugar. So what we have to understand here is the relationship or the difference between prediabetes and diabetes, right? Prediabetes is not technically diabetes yet because by most intents and purposes, it's reversible, okay? You're in a spot where you could get yourself out of that stage, right? But the lion's share of prediabetes cases end up going undetected until they are full-blown diabetes cases, at which point it's not technically reversible from a clinical standpoint, although you could probably make some pretty solid efforts and at least get yourself into what I would consider like almost a remission type state. Okay, so this PLOS1 research was interesting because it determined that subjects that consumed ginseng based upon this meta-analysis ended up seeing reductions in their fasting glucose levels by a pretty decent amount. Now, with this, they noticed that it was a decrease in about 0.31 millimoles per liter. Okay, so that's a pretty significant amount. But we cannot say with certainty that this is 100% going to happen with everybody and it's the case. But we certainly don't know the mechanisms because with a large meta-analysis like this, we just have to kind of take a guess. But what is fascinating is if you think about the previous research that I was talking about surrounding the gut microbiome and the postbiotics, that could be what is interesting here. Okay, if our gut microbiome has to work on metabolizing a specific compound, that could ultimately affect our overall blood glucose, right? The other thing is, is if somehow we are getting some form of beneficial factor in our gut microbiome by consuming ginseng, then maybe we are influencing 
our glucose via what are called short chain fatty acids, sort of the downstream effect of a healthy microbiome. That is a little bit of a leap. One of the things that has been demonstrated in other evidence looking at other powerful antioxidants is that antioxidants can play a decent role in glucose modulation as well. Okay, now the mechanism in which they do that is multiple fold, right? This can happen a lot of different ways. But essentially, if you have a cell that is under a lot of stress from reactive oxygen species and you have heavy antioxidant effects that are helping to sort of lessen the load on that cell, so to speak, you can resurrect that mitochondria and allow it to be more capable of utilizing fuel. You see, we have multiple problems that are happening when we look at insulin resistance. We have the pancreatic beta cells actually being damaged and not functioning well and not producing insulin, but then we also have, or producing too much, right, because they're not sensing right, or you have a cell that is resistant to sucking up glucose. A cell that is resistant to sucking up glucose, that problem isn't as simple as just the receptor not being there, right? There are many things going on. Perhaps the receptor isn't coming to the surface of a cell because the cell is dysfunctional. Perhaps the mitochondria cannot utilize the fuel properly so it creates more reactive oxygen species, more oxidative stress, right? So again, we're speculating here, but the bottom line is that the larger bodies of research combined with these more nuancy mechanistic things are starting to show that there certainly isn't a downside to taking ginseng. It may not be a miracle compound, but the activation of sirtuins, the stopping of adipose formation, the increase in lipolysis, the microbiome effect, and the blood sugar modulation effect, it seems to have huge metabolic benefits that I think we should be looking at. So then the question is, how much do you take? Like, what is enough? How should you get it? And there's different forms, right? There's Panax ginseng, there's red, there's white, there's fresh ginseng. Typically, people like to go for either the white or the red ginseng, okay? Those are ones that have been aged like four to six years or red ginseng six plus years, okay? It's arguable that the longer it's been aged, the more powerful and potent it becomes. And that could be the case, but recently I've been seeing interesting research surrounding the world of white ginseng. And based upon the data that I'm seeing, it looks as though a couple of grams per day would be beneficial. What I like to do is there's even like inexpensive tea that is decaf green tea with ginseng. I can't remember the brand. It's like, I don't know, the Bigelow's are really cheap one, right? It's not the best quality tea, but it's interesting that they have ginseng alongside decaf green tea. So it's something that I bring into the afternoon because ginseng obviously has these energy benefits that are great, but the health benefit is a completely different situation. So I would recommend you add ginseng in via your tea so that you're kind of getting it in sort of a... Um, a liquid form that's been heated. It might help you get a little bit more out of it that way. Easy thing to add, cheap thing to add. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.